Good afternoon, morning, whatever it is. I'm Joshua Finn from JNH Aerospace. We uh, we put together a couple videos a while back on model rocket designs for the rocket-powered gliders, and people enjoyed those. I'm glad y'all enjoyed them. And there were more questions that were asked, and I decided I was going to roll all of that into one video. Basically, the questions come down to individual mechanisms on the aircraft that we showed, and questions about other rocket designs. So what we're going to do instead of just covering that is we're going to go kind of th through a little bit of a history lesson. So the first model rocket gliders uh, that I've been able to find information about uh, would have been designs like this. This is the old Astron Falcon from Estes. Um, this is not stock. I, I built it uh, very, very lightly from uh, modifications I made. I uh, converted it to a 13 millimeter engine because the 18 millimeters were just stupid overkill on it, etc. This is about as simple as it gets. You've got an aircraft that basically uh, converts from rocket to glider through a center of gravity change. So it goes up with an engine on board, the ejection charge from the engine kicks the engine casing out, and now the CG slides far enough forward that you get a fairly, uh, fairly good glide. The problem with that is, uh, as you start going to more and more powerful engines, the aircraft begins to loop. You can get rid of some of that by having a high thrust line, so you get some down pitching. Um, but with really high performance designs, the most highly developed of that era being uh, aircraft like the Sky Slash 2 and so on, um, the aircraft would go straight as long as the engine is burning and then it would start doing giant loops. Um, great flying aircraft, but it, it, it's kind of limited in performance by that. Uh, the other thing is you've got a, an engine casing flying through the air uh, after ejection and there were complaints about safety and so on, so you have to at least attach a streamer to it, etc. Well, then it could still cause a fire and so on. Um, some of that's overblown, some of it's not, but either way, these have kind of fallen in, out of favor because they're not the, the ultimate option. The other thing that was introduced in the same era was the idea of uh, putting a, doing a parasite glider where you would mount, uh, just hang the aircraft on, on the side of the rocket, you know, both of these ideas came out in the uh, early to mid 60s. Um, and so you have a larger rocket, and when it gets up to altitude, the ejection charge fires, creating, causing separation. The rocket slows down dramatically. The glider has nothing holding it on. So it, so it you know, you're, you're going up, and um, Newton's laws of motion, you know, objects in motion tend to stay in motion. There's nothing holding this on, so the rocket stops. Glider continues on and flies free. Uh, big issue with that is to make the glider big enough to be visible, it starts to impact the performance of the rocket and its stability. Uh, you're hauling along a lot of extra mass so you can't get as good an altitude, so forth and so on. Uh, the one nice thing is you can build the glider surprisingly light and still get it to hold together because it's not experiencing huge stresses. Um, and actually, the first rocket glider I ever owned boost glider, whatever you want to call it, uh, was this one. This is the Estes Manta. I've had this thing for over 20 years, uh, and it, it works off that same principle. It's just a little foam glider that uh, mounts onto the side of the rocket, and these fly pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, this was during Estes's period of its nice colored body tubes. These things are not very strong, and you can see where I've had to repair this body tube many times just on basic flight loads. It starts to collapse over time. The glider's pretty good, though. Uh, the next step up in the game, of course, um, is to go to a true pot pod boost glider. These launch nice and straight, they're easy to fly, um, and they're still, this basic layout's pretty popular nowadays. Uh, the biggest challenge is when you pop this um, front end assembly free, and I see my shock cord has failed getting the news that I'm not trying to fly this one today. Um, all the baggage coming out uh, of the front and the glider sliding forward uh, tends to create a tangle, so um, you have to be kind of careful with those. Uh, I've never had huge problems with it, but uh, it's very easy to get your competition flights disqualified that way. Uh, this aircraft is the uh, Delta Cat. I believe it's an uh, MPC design uh, from the 70s or 80s. Um, 
they fly great. Not a super high performer, but very, very reliable. Um, just a good design in general. This is one of my own design uh, pop pod gliders. So if you notice, this one has the uh, this little tongue inside, kind of a complex little mechanism. It works all right, uh, but you, I had to modify it some to make sure that it would stay on because every once in a while you would launch it, and the uh, as soon as it came off the launch rod, it would separate, and that kind of ends your flying. Um, this system uses uh, two tongues on either side. Uh, to lock in, and this has worked pretty well. This is for a uh, little Micromax 1 8 uh, motors. Um, very, very small mechanism. Uh, hopefully, the camera focuses in on it. Um, and this just slides free as usual. Uh, and this is this is the basic layout that we use on um, uh, that's used on the vast majority of boost gliders. So so far, we've got aircraft that separate at launch, uh, or at ejection, to, so you have extra stuff that comes down. Okay, so moving on to our, uh, our rocket gliders. Um, somebody wanted me to feature the uh, Switchblade XP, but unfortunately mine is hiding in a box somewhere, and I didn't have time to go fuss with locating it. Um, this is the aircraft you've seen in the, uh, in the flight test videos, and uh, this is kind of the, these are the most advanced uh, swing wing gliders really out there in that they're, they're simple and they're, they're fairly, um, fairly weight efficient. The traditional designs have these sheaths that the center of the wing would be in, uh, similar to what you would see on a full scale aircraft like the F-111 or the B-1B, um, any of those where there's this huge mechanism out here and that's heavy and draggy. Uh, and it blocks off part of your wing that really can't even produce lift. Uh, so they fly okay, but they're, they're complex uh, and honestly a little bit unreliable because there's a lot of friction in that mechanism. It's very hard to make it reliable. These always open. Um, the big question that a few people had was not so much on the mechanism of this aircraft, though we'll go into it, uh, but rather this plunger assembly that I use. And as you can see right here, uh, we have the, uh, the release line running from, from our wings all the way up here, and it latches around this pin that goes into an aluminum tube. So you can see this pin slides on the nose cone and releases there. So that pin fits in, and we run our trigger line. Excuse me a second. Run our trigger line through here, through this little loop, and... I'm playing Captain Clumsy today. So we simply capture that around that pin. We slide it in. The wing is, the wing is properly in place. So when the ejection charge fires, what's important to notice is we've actually got a, a tension line over here. So when this thing fires forward, nose cone comes all the way out like that, and you see where it's eroded by the uh, uh, ejection charges. Then it's captured and it pulls back in. Uh, this is pretty much the most advanced I have ever gotten with one of these mechanisms. Um, and this thing, honestly, has worked great. Uh, other things that are worth noting is we have a shock absorption system on our wings so that they can actually slide out very slightly under load and come back in. Um, and that's not all. So we've got that part of things. The other thing is I've got a, uh, a burn band on here so that um, if I were to put a, a dethermalizer fuse in and come out there and you see the wing starts to come up, we've got the line caught on it. Um, problem with this, of course, is I, it, it was a brilliant idea except for the fact that I have a rubber band out here and you can see that there is rust on this thing. And that is because it's hanging out in the exhaust path of the engine. So the issue at hand is you launch this thing and uh, about a fraction of a second into the flight this rubber band burns through um, and just the weight of the aircraft holds that down so even if you burn through here you'll never get the, nose, the, the tail to pop up because the, the tensioner is broken on it. So it ends up not working. Uh, what, what I need is a spring in here. Lower this thing down, put a spring in. Um, and that would work well. The spring would rust over time and need to be replaced, uh, but it would work. Um, 
And of course, the other thing is if you pull this rubber band loose in here, you can actually remove the entire mechanism for, uh, for storage. Um, and this, this guy pulls through, and you can remove the, uh, the fuselage, uh, the tail there. This thing packs down pretty nice. The uh, problem is that then you've got to remember where all those pieces went. So, cool design, flies great, uh, just uh, not as practical as I'd hoped for. This is a, a, a similar design. Actually, we're, well, let's stay on, on track with this one. Uh, this is what we ultimately graduated to with the Switchblade S and the Switchblade XP, which is to just have a re retained uh, nose assembly that kind of hangs under the rocket and doesn't create very much drag. They, they work very well. And this, as you can see, is a much, much simpler mechanism. Um, you do have to go to the, the release pin as you get larger because you're looking at a, a much larger nose assembly and so on. Um, you've got more stuff hanging out. Um, so if you wanted to scale this up to D or E size, you would, you would need to go back to that other design. Um, but for this size, it works, works very nicely. Uh, even up into the um, A and B, maybe even C size classes. So, we have this design over here. Oh, you noticed my shirt. Yes, that's what happens in video editing. Uh, this is another design we're working on that um, uh, we're hoping to kit this in the future, but there's a little bit of challenges I'll mention. The uh, great thing about it is it's a single pivot, so everything lines up much more easily. Um, more reliable design, and since we have a wire catch on this, um, there are no strings to worry about. So on this system, the ejection charge fires, the nose cone slides forward, and it opens. The whole thing is controlled by this little um, slide stop fits right in here. Now as you notice, we have to hinge the wings and that's where the problems arise with this design. You've got this nice little hold down in the back that you can use to secure them. Um, but that means that they have to be hinged. Um, some of the, the problems can be alleviated by just putting the uh, stab incidents back in here to provide your uh, stability and glide, your trim and glide. Um, but it still doesn't fix all of the problems. The issue with this airplane is that it glides exceptionally well, uh, but when you launch it, these, uh, these wings start to flex up uh, tremendously under, uh, under the elevated speeds, and the aircraft goes into a death spiral, and nothing you do can, can stop it. Um, on this upper wing, that's easy to solve. We can just put a, a stop up here to prevent the wing from flexing up anymore. If you do that on this lower wing, however, we now have a clearance issue with the wing riding on top of it. So what you need is a ramp assembly so that as this wing rotates back it also slides upward to clear the, uh, the uh, parts on the lower wing. So got a solution figured out on that. Uh, it's just going to take a little bit of time to do it. I uh, did want to point out on this design, uh, as mentioned uh, before, we have the, uh, the pin actuated system on this one. Just like on the uh, on the larger switchblade, so that string comes down and it catches on this on this pin. So just to review, because nobody ever gets tired of that apparently. Um, and so yeah, you, you use this line running through here down to this this little pin. Notice on this one and and on the other one, I don't have the rubber band pulling this nose cone back. Um, I came to the conclusion. That's really not an aerodynamically inefficient condition to be in because this is a fairly clean setup. Uh, last one, this is kind of, uh, these are very popular uh, in uh, FAI competition, uh, what's called a scissor flop. Um, and this one is built bone stock. This, I built this before I got into the swing wings because uh, it was what everybody was doing, so it was the cool thing to do. Uh, and this uses a burn string. The burn string runs along here. Um, in front of the engine, and when the engine fires its ejection charge, it burns through that string, which releases everything. Um, I'm having trouble, I can't just cut through it, so we'll just release it over there. And everything swings out. You know, so these wings, wingtips fold under. I've got a spring-loaded uh, rotating mechanism, a little carbon pin. 
Um, this thing works great. It's very reliable. It's never failed me. Uh, my complaint with it is it's just not that efficient. Um, it doesn't launch as high as, say, this guy. Actually, that's apples and oranges. Let's compare apples to apples. This launches higher than this. Um, didn't used to be that way. It used to be that these swing wings, because the weight and all the complexity did not go as high as these, the wire saddles on these have changed that. So pretty cool in that regard. Uh, but anyway, so you know, the, the burn string is a, another way of, uh, of releasing these. It works very well. My complaint with it is you have to rig a new spring or string after every flight, uh, as opposed to uh, just going and saying, whoop, we got that in there. Take the, um, let's get masking tapes tight. We'll get it out later. But pull out a new engine, put another one in, and, and off you go. Um, this, I don't mind this part, because this is fine, but tying a new string on here, and this is actually um, spider wire, so I would not actually use this, so I would have to actually tie a knot there. Um, it's just time I don't want to spend. Not when you can do that. Uh, you could rig this uh, a similar way to that, although the better way would be to have your nose cone on a slider and have some sort of plunger out here so it would uh, release back there and, and off you go. Um, but, either way, so cool little mechanism. And these fly great. They launch very straight. Um, not many failure modes. These do too, just my opinion. Anyway, if you have any further questions about these, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, we're happy to answer more questions about them, um, and hopefully we'll be bringing some more on, online soon. We're kind of getting low on kits, but we're uh, trying to retool. We, um, we're going to get a laser cutter very soon so we don't have to outsource that activity, and that'll help us uh, produce things uh, quicker and also be able to introduce some more products because we'll be able to, to test everything w without all the time delays and whatnot. So anyway, uh, thank you for watching. Have a nice day.